Man, it's exciting to see all you guys. You could probably cut me down just a tad, uh, David, because I'm going to speak a little bit louder here in a moment, and I'll be able to, to work the microphone. This is First Wednesday. It's exciting to see everybody. Man, God bless you. Fantastic. A Sunday morning experience on a Wednesday night. This is really great. This is when my heart's vision, uh, what, last year, I guess. We've been doing this for about a year, maybe over a year. I'm not sure. But when we launched these, uh, we wanted the whole family to come together. It's a lot of time you call it family night on Wednesday, and then when you get to church, you defamily everybody. But, uh, you know, the kids go one place and the adults go another place and the youth go somewhere else. So once a month, we're a family. And I'm so excited to have all of you here. And uh, this is a great, great time. Uh, tonight, I want to uh, do part two of the message that we did on Sunday morning. How many were here on Sunday morning? If you are not here Sunday morning, you might want to watch lesson number one, what was called the press. Now tonight we're calling it the final move and we're going to Philippians chapter three. So find Philippians chapter three and we'll get there in a minute. But tonight is part two of the two part message. I did the first part on Sunday morning on New Year's Eve. We called that the press. And then tonight is the final move. Our key text has been from Philippians chapter 3, verses 12, 13, and 14. Now go ahead and find in your Bibles chapter 3, and we will have some things on the screen, but not everything, so you want to find it in your Bible. We also have notes loaded up on the YouVersion Bible app. I did that just for the benefit of my bolt girl up here in the front row. She is always so excited to find the YouVersion notes, and if the YouVersion notes are not there, I always get a frown. So give me a big smile, Miss Karen. She's grinning from ear to ear. She She's happy today. Does anybody not know what I'm talking about? If you download on your phone the YouVersion Bible app, I think you have to make an account. Of course, it's free. Maybe you don't have to make an account. But if you download the YouVersion Bible app, when you open it on your phone, make sure that it has the access to your location settings, and then you click on More, and then you go down to Events. And when you say the word events, you click on that and all the notes for the sermons that we preach here on Family First pop right up. So you'll see the notes from Sunday morning are still there. They usually stay there for about six or seven days. And then the notes for tonight are there and we're calling this one the move. Did everybody find it? Philippians chapter 3, not in your, in your phone, but in your Bible. So Philippians chapter 3, this has been our key text. Look, look at these three verses as I get started. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. How many things, church? One thing, not five things, not ten things, not everybody else's things, not everybody else that wants to be my thing, but one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and straining, pressing, striving towards what is ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We're looking at this for our inspiration from kind of an athletic or a, a sports background. The Apostle Paul does write a lot of analogies. He, he uses a lot of illustrations from the athletic world. The Bible uses different illustrations from the medical world, from our physical bodies, etc. And the Apostle Paul, he says quite a few things in his writings about athletics. So we wanted to make that video. And again, thank you, Pastor Michelle, for putting that together. Listen to this as we launch the the most intense part of any athletic contest is always referred to as the press. Say that with me. The press. If it's a game, if it's a race, if it's a fight, what, whatever you want to call it, when, when it's crunch time. How many know what that means? When, when it's the game is on the line, when it's time to really make the victory secure, it's, it's a press. You've got a fourth and long, and uh, it's towards the end of the game, and it's obviously a passing situation. And so what does the defense do? They press against the offense. They'll often do a blitz. They don't wait for the offense to bring the game to them. They press it to the offense. The heavy lifter on the bench 
presses to make lift the maximum amount possible. The prize fighter, he presses the match towards his opponent. It's getting into the 10th round and he doesn't really sure if he's going to win on points. So he realizes he's only got a hundred and uh, some seconds left to make a difference. So he doesn't lay back, but he presses the match against his opponent. You saw on the screen, I don't know if you know what you were sawing, seeing. 2001, Lance Armstrong is going up out Duez. I think on Sunday I said that was in the uh, Alps of France. I think it's probably the Pyrenees Mountains in France. And uh, he looks behind and he stares down Jan Ulrich, his primary opponent. And it likes, he just like stares him down and says, are you coming? Is there anything left in your legs? I'm going to attack you right now. And he just, Jan Ulrich couldn't respond. And Lance Armstrong just rides on up the mountain. How many think it's time to put on a full court press against the devil? I think it's time to stare down darkness and say, devil, you are not defeating me. You are not slowing me down. You are not opposing me. You are not restricting me. I'm going to press towards the mark of the prize of the high call, the upward call of God for my life. It's time to full throw a full court press against the devil. It's time to take the conflict to the enemy. Pull out all the stops. Stop holding the punches. Desperate times call for desperate action. This is 2020. People have been asking me. I was having a conversation with someone this afternoon. What do you think is going to happen in 2024? I'm not a prophet. I mean, I prophesy sometimes, but I, I don't read the future. I can't look into my crystal ball. But I am going to tell you, the, the nation, the culture is absolutely going to go more insane than what it already is in 2024. I, I wish that wasn't the case. I wish I could prevent that from being the case. But you see the handwriting on the wall. You see the Pre pre preparations of that are already in place not just politically that is a very strategic way that things are going to come unraveled but in other areas the culture is just literally coming apart at the seams but how many know the crazier it gets the more the gospel of Jesus Christ can shine brighter the darker the world the greater the light can shine and the Bible says for the days of John the Baptist until now the kingdom of God has suffered violence but the violent take it by force. How many want to take some force against the violence of hell tonight? You want to press against the darkness and see God do great things in your life in 2024. Sunday, I gave you seven things that were the components of the press, the full court press against darkness. This is real quick review. I'll just remind you and then we'll get to the last one and we'll spend our time tonight. And I don't want to have plenty of time tonight for some altar ministry at the end. But from Sunday, number one review was you must constantly realize that you have not yet arrived. The Apostle Paul said, forgetting what lies behind, I'm going to press on. Not that I already have obtained all this or have been made perfect, but I press on. You must constantly keep in mind you haven't made it yet. I'm not going to... Uh, take a lot of time to review on Sunday, but that's the most important thing. He wasn't talking about not being saved. He wasn't talking about the kingdom. He wasn't talking about being blessed. He had all of these things already, but he said, I want to gain Christ, to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own. I want to desire, this is verses 8 through 11. I wanted to know him and the power of his resurrection. I want to desire to share in his sufferings. And ultimately, he says that by any means possible, I may attain unto the resurrection from the dead. What he's talking about is I want to obtain the upward call of God for my life. The destiny, the plans and the purposes of God for your life. How many know you can be saved, but never fulfill the destiny of God for your life? Amen. You can be on your way to heaven, but never walk in the plans and the purposes that God. The Bible says this. I'll just give you this verse, Ephesians 2.10. We might have this one. For we are his workmanship created in Jesus Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God's got destiny. 
He's got plans for you. It's more than just making it to heaven. It's just more than getting saved. It's just more than hoping you have, uh, you know, your salvation in the sweet by and by. I'm glad that I've got salvation in the sweet by and by. That's going to be wonderful. But right now I'm in the nasty now and now. And I want to know that I can survive in these times. And I can have the strength and the wisdom of God in my life to push against all the powers of hell. So number one was you must constantly realize you have not yet won the prize. We're going to give you the whole list of review here. Number two was you must consistently keep on forgetting the past. Number three, you must clearly envision the future. All of these line up with the text in Philippians chapter 3. Number four, you must relentlessly pursue your destiny. Number five, you must carefully listen to God's correction. Number six, you must aggressively pursue mentorship. And now we're ready for number seven. So tonight, we're going to use number seven as the final move. We're in a full court press. The clock is just about to run out. Here is the final countdown. Here's like the two-minute warning. Here's the last move as a part of your full port crest against darkness. You must prayerfully. Everybody say prayerfully. You must prayerfully. I hope everybody's here for a word tonight. I hope you're not here to get entertained. I hope you're not here to have your ears tickled. I hope you're not here to hear tradition, religion. I hope you're here to hear some strength and some wisdom, things that will help you in the future. And I'm excited to have the whole family here tonight, teenagers, moms and dads, uh, young adults. This applies to everybody. What I'm going to teach is so important for younger people. But I want to tell you what I'm going to teach is also very, very important for every person in the family of God. Because you must prayerfully identify and eliminate wrong people from your life. Right things start happening when wrong people start leaving your life. Listen to this. Whenever God wants to bless you, he'll bring someone new into your life. Whenever Satan wants to hurt you, he will bring someone new into your life. Whenever God gets ready to protect you, he often will take someone out of your life. What I'm going to teach tonight, this whole message has to do with the law of association. I've taught the law of association to a lot of you in the room in mentorship classes that we've done. The law of association probably, possibly is the most important of all the kingdom laws. I mean, I have all the kingdom laws identified. I could, I could list them for you. And I'm not talking about the law in the sense of, you know, the book of, of, uh, uh, of Moses and, and, the, and the legalistic uh, um, methods of the Old Testament, but the principles of the kingdom of God, out of all the kingdom principles, the law of association might be the most important one of all. Because get this, the associations you choose will determine whether you win or lose. We're on a battle. We're on a team. And we're not going to win by ourselves. So the other people that you put on your team are either for you Or they're against you. They will either help you or they will hinder you. The most important decisions you make in your life, other than giving your heart to Jesus, is who you're going to bring into your inner circle in your life. Who are you going to surround yourself? What other people are you going to share your most intimate, personal thoughts and feelings in your inner circle of your life? Because the associations you choose, they'll determine whether you win or lose. They'll help you, they'll encourage you, they'll assist you, or they will drag you down and destroy you. If this was all teenagers in the room, I'd say it this way. We're not all teenagers, but I'll I'll still say it this way. The associations you choose will determine whether you win or lose, or we could put it this way. Show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. Show me who you hang out with. And I'll show you what your life could be looking like or will be looking like in the next little while. Oh, but pastor, I'm going to change them. I'm, I'm, going, to, I, I'm going to really help them. I'm going to be a light in the darkness. I hope you are and, and I pray that you are. But 
Holiness is not transferable, but defilement is. I can't take the time to go to the book of Haggai. That's, that's deep. Holiness is not transferable, but defilement is. Let me give you an illustration. If I've got a disease, no, don't, don't nobody get upset. Uh, I don't have a disease. <laughs> In fact, I had a sniffle the other day. I just got to say this. It's okay. I had a sniffle the other day, and I woke up, and my, I, I shocked the daylights out of my wife because by the time she got up out of bed, I said, I already made an appointment this morning. I got online. I'm going to the doctor today. She said, what? Because, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it would take a court order to send me to the doctor. <laughs> so I go to the doctor, 8 o'clock, first appointment of the morning. I go in and the little guy behind the desk says, oh, our, our, our uh, what do he call them? Our providers, that's what he called them. Our, our medical providers aren't even here yet. And I said, well, I got the first appointment of the day, so they better be here quick. And, and so the, they said, what's your symptoms? And I, I, I got a sniffle, I got a cough, and I could see it in their eyes. <laughs> I could just see it. So they, they whisked me away to a side room. I mean, it was a little bit annoying, to tell you the truth. The, the girl, the, the nurse, she locked the, not locked it, but she closed the door, and on her way out, she pushed a button that turned on an air purifier system <laughs> in the room I was at. And then she comes back, another uh, nurse comes out, and she's got, what do we call it, PPE? She's got masks, she's got gloves. She's got on a zoot suit. I mean, I mean, from and, and she says, I don't suppose you've had a, <clears throat> a, a, a COVID test, have you? I said, of course I haven't had a COVID test. She said, well, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to do one. I said, okay, you can do a COVID test if you want. You get the extra cash from your, you know, that, that's how it works. So anyway, they swabbed me up my nose. And it, it's like crazy. And then she, it, well, I said, how long does this take? She said, well, we'll, we'll know for in 15 minutes. So like in 10 minutes, she sneaks back in the room and she's looking. Well, it's looking negative so far. And I'm saying, good. And then she, and, and in a few minutes, she, she pulled down her mask. And then she started taking off her gloves. And she actually started looking like I was a human being again. Because I, I didn't have COVID. So even though I coughed a little bit a week or so ago when I was preaching, I did not have COVID, and I've got the medical report to prove it to you. So where was I going with that? Oh, I do. <laughs> Holiness is not transferable, but defilement is. If I had COVID, which I don't, but if I had COVID... I could come over here to Pastor Bailey and I could sneeze right in his face and he would probably get COVID. But if he did not have COVID and he came over here and blew in my face, he could not heal me because holiness is not transferable, but defilement is. Are you, are you grabbing a hold of that? Oh, but pastor, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go fix all these broken people. Well, they need fixed. I'll, I'll tell you the truth. They, they do need fixed. But this might be the most important thing I've said, I'll say tonight for the young people in the room. There's nothing in this book that ever authorizes you to do missionary dating. Cross-cultural ministry is not a relationship. Cross-cultural ministry is going to another part of the world, like Pastor Rachel, and, and preaching the gospel. Cross-cultural ministry is taking the gospel to, to Cambodia or to Uganda. Or Cross-cultural ministry is not giving your life in a relationship with someone that's not right with God, hoping that you might save them. I know you might have good intentions, but I'll also tell you that holiness is not transferable, but defilement is. And most of the time, there might be exceptions, most of the time you will not help them, but they will destroy you. It's the truth. I'm, I'm telling you the, 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 the honest to God truth. So right things start happening when wrong people start leaving your life. Find Philippians 3 
And uh, I want to start reading for a little while, and then we're going to run through this pretty quick. I want to start reading in uh, verse 15, and we'll lay the foundation for this. Philippians chapter 3, start reading with me, watch with verse 15. But those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Now, listen. For many of whom I have told you often and now tell you even with tears, they walk as enemies of the cross. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory is their shame. With minds set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like His glorious body, and that by the power that enables Him to subject all things to Himself. There's seven things in there. I don't know if you saw them as we read through them, but I'll point them out to you. There's seven things in there. There's seven people. Now, I'm not talking about seven people. I'm not talking about, and I'm careful if I, about names. What I could dream up some names. We don't have nobody in the, name, in the church named Henry, I don't think. So I'm not talking about Henry, and, and I, I, I'm starting to get in trouble. I'm looking around. Names are coming to my mind. I said, no, 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 there's one of those sitting over there. So I'm not talking about seven particular people. I'm talking about seven kinds of people that you do not need in your future. They don't qualify to be in your future. I said Sunday because they don't want to pay the price to go to the future that you are going to. And so they're not willing to pay the price to go where you're going. They want to defile you to keep you from going there because you're a conviction to them because they don't want to pay the price that they see in your life to go where you're going. So you can't drag them with you. You have to move on without them. Now, some of you in the room that have a really strong mercy gift are probably really going to have some problems with this message tonight. And you might text me. You, you, you might buy, like be emailing me or, or calling me. Uh, and, and you might be offended. I, I don't want to offend you. I, I, I'm not against your mercy gift. But I'm telling you, sometimes you got to keep your mercy gift under control of the witness of the Holy Spirit. Or your good intentions will destroy your life. Yes. Because people will literally chew you up and spit you out. And they will prevent you from going to the future. But God, oh, say, are you ready? Seven kinds of people. Number one, those who walk differently than the instructions that they have been given. Verse 15, all this is the word of God, 100% right in this one chapter. Verse 15, let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. I love this verse. There's this like, this is like sarcasm. I love it because like the apostle Paul is being like sarcastic. He's, he's being like procrastic. That's a combination of prophetic and sarcastic all at the same time. So what he's saying is if you're mature, if you agree with me, this is what Paul's saying. He's saying, if you're mature and if you agree with me, that's great. But then he's saying, if you don't see it this way, if you don't agree with me, then you're, you're immature. And guess what? God will reveal it to you eventually anyway. God will straighten you out. <laughs> so what he's saying is the revelation, what has been revealed to you are the things that God has shown you. How does God show you things? He shows you things through the word of God, right? He shows you things through people of God. He shows you things through the structure that is revealed in the word of God. He shows you things through your parents. He shows you things through your teachers. He shows you things through preachers. He shows you things through prophetic voices. And what he's saying is if you act or think differently than the way that things have been revealed to you otherwise, then God's going to have to straighten you out because you're going to suffer pain because the people that God has brought into your life have shown you the way of life, the way of the future, the way of victory. But if you will not not walk in accordance with the instructions that you have been given, those kinds of people that
that are rebellious, that are resistant, that will not listen to the voice of God. You do not need those people in your life. Now, listen to this. I was very careful. and I think the Holy Spirit dropped a couple things into me today as I was was praying about this. There's probably going to be a course correction in their life. Because of what it says, God will reveal this to them. God will set them straight. But when God sets them straight, you won't, don't want to be around when God gives them a course correction. Because there's going to be a course correction in their life. But if you happen to be hanging around when they get their course corrected, you might suffer some of the consequences of their rebellion and resistance against God. Let me give you some pictures. Jonah got his course corrected in the belly of a whale. Peter got his course corrected after the rooster crowed. Balaam got his course corrected after he got spoken through from a donkey. Thank you. How many of you have ever got spoken by a donkey? And if you're in the presence of someone else that gets their course corrected, you might suffer the consequence of the storm. Jonah was not the only one in the boat. There was a whole bunch of other people in the boat. And they were all about done because it was Jonah's fault. And they didn't want to throw him overboard, but eventually they did. Because they knew that nobody on the boat could fix him, but God had prepared a whale out in the ocean that could fix him. And our strong motivation mercy gifts a lot of times is, oh, I just got to keep them in my life. I just got to pull them alongside. It's like a lot of people, if Jonah got thrown out of the ship, a lot of people in the body of Christ today would have wanted to throw him the lifeline. They would have wanted to throw him the tow rope. They would have wanted to pull him behind the boat on a ski rope or something just because they couldn't let him go because they're they're motivated by their mercy and by the, I love people. I love to fix people. This is a strong word, but I don't know if you can grasp it or handle it. Some people don't want to be fixed. And some people, even if they need to be fixed, you're not the one ordained to fix them. Nobody in the boat could fix Jonah. Only the whale could. None of the other disciples could straighten out Peter. Only the little girl could that heard him cursing and swearing. And then he heard the rooster crow. Peter got corrected by a rooster. Balaam got per- corrected by a donkey. Jonah got corrected by a whale. And yet we think we can correct everybody. Everybody grabbing some of this? You cannot fix those who will not be fixed. I love them. Pray for them. Ask God to bring the consequences to their life so that they will repent and turn to God. But if you hang around, you're just enabling them. You're just delaying their course correction with God. And you don't need those people in your life. Are you with me? That's number one. Those who will not walk in accordance with the instruction they have been given. Number two, we're going to go a little bit quicker. Those who walk in contradiction to the teaching of mentors. Look at verses 16 and 17. Only let us hold true... To what we have obtained. Brothers, now this is Paul. Okay, Paul's talking to the Philippians. He's talking to us. He says, brothers, join in imitating me. Follow me as I follow Christ. And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Similar to the first point, but it's just a little bit different. Keep your eyes on the people that God has put in your life. And follow their instruction and their mentorship because the people that you don't need in your future are people that will not listen to the voice of mentorship. They're the kind of people that say silly things. They say things, well, I want to learn my lessons the hard way. I don't want to learn my lessons the hard way. I want to learn my lessons the word way. I don't want to learn from pain. I want to learn from other people people. 
A lot of people, they just get into that. I hear this all the time. I really do. And every time I just cringe because people have no idea really what they're saying, Tyler. They say these things and they really don't understand what they're saying. They'll say things like, well, you know, uh, 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 experience is the best teacher. Not really. It's just the most painful. I'd rather avoid painful lessons by learning instructions from other people rather than having to experience the same pain that somebody else experiences. So you don't need those kind of people in your life that will not listen to mentorship. And I'm not going to linger here, and I'm just going to say this quickly, and then I'll move on. On the 14th of January, Shelton, our Connect Group leader, you can see that board in the back, FFA Connect Groups. There's about 15, 20 brochures on that wall. In two weeks, we're launching the spring semester for Connect Groups here at Family First. And that Sunday, the 14th of January, there's going to be a display, tabletops, all in the cafe, Global Brew, down this hallway. All the Connect Group leaders are going to have their information and they're going to tell you what's going on in their Connect Group and how you can get connected with one of them so you feel you're connected to somebody else in the body of Christ. Are you listening to what I'm saying? And one of the connect groups, I'm just, this is the first time I've probably said this publicly in three or four years. I'm going to resume personal mentorship classes. It's on the third Tuesday night, third Tuesday night of the month. The first one will be January the 16th, and this is an open invitation. Usually I don't mention this. Usually it's not even talked about publicly. But if you're interested in being a part of that, you talk to me, and I will invite you to come and be a part of that mentorship teaching so that you can grow under the teaching of mentors. Everybody okay? All right, number three. I think we're doing okay on time because I want to have time at the end. Number three, those who are enemies of the cross are people that you do not need in your life. Look at verse 18. For many of whom I have often told you about. So in other words, Paul, this is not uh, the first time he's ever said this. This is, he said, I've told you guys this sort of thing over and over. I've told you before, and now I'm saying it again, even with tears. There are people that walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. He's talking about false teachers here. I'm not sure really who he has in mind. He might have in mind the Judaizers who are adding works to faith to be saved. He might be talking about legalists that say there's all kinds of external rules and obligations that you have to keep to add to your faith to be saved. He might be talking about the libertines, which is the opposite of a legalist. A libertine is the person that says, oh, well, just live any old way you want to live. If it feels good, do it. They were of that cult, uh, was called called Gnosticism that said, well, everything that is holy is spiritual, but everything that is fleshly is sinful. So they were basically of the philosophy, eat, drink, and be merry, for it really doesn't matter how you live. God will just keep on forgiving all your sin. How many of those kinds of people are enemies of the cross of Christ? Those kind of people are the people that preach in this day and age a hyper grace philosophy that say just keep on sinning because the grace of God. Oh, you know what Paul said, where sin abound, the grace of God hath that much more abounded. And their philosophy is, oh, God is gracious. God just forgives all sin. In the end, love wins. Not always. Because there's some things that God loves more than people. I don't know why I'm letting you pull all this out of me, but there's some things that God loves more than people. I'll tell you one thing he loves more than, than people, and this might offend you, but if you'll think it through, you'll understand. He loves himself. Now that's deep. He loves his own integrity. He loves his own holiness. He loves his own purity. He loves his own justice. And he cannot stop being who he is. He cannot overlook sin. He cannot wink an eye at a rebellion. He loves people. But there are some things that he loves more than people. That's why he sent his son Jesus. And there's only one way to be saved. And that's the repentance and confession of sin. So I'm not sure who Paul's talking about, but he's, he, he says this uh, over and over. It's in Acts chapter 20. He says uh, in Acts chapter 20, uh, pay careful attention to all the flock of God in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church. For after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. 
And from among your own selves, wise uh, men will arise speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after themselves. Second Timothy 3.13. While evil people and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You do not need people in your life that are enemies of the cross. People that make fun of the church. People that make fun of... I'm just being real now to the teenagers. People that will laugh at you for going to church on a Wednesday night. I don't care how popular they are. I don't care how many likes they have on their Instagram page. I don't how, care how many other friends they have that make you feel like you, you should be in their inner circle. You do not need those kinds of people in your life. They're enemies of the cross of Christ. And they will destroy what is precious to you. The next three are real quick. They're all from one verse. Verse 19. Number four. Those whose goal is destruction. Philippians 3.19. Their end is destruction. In other words, that's their goal. That's what they're setting out to do. Their goal is division. Their intention is trouble. Their purpose is to be a problem. You don't need those kinds of people in your life. I'm saying this is quick. That was number four. Those whose goal is destruction. Number five. Those whose God is their belly. Philippians 3.19, their end is destruction and their God is their belly. What's that mean? They're sensual people. They're fleshly people. They're people that only want to do what feels good. Only what pleases their own flesh. They do only those things that make themselves feel good. He says you don't need those kind of people in your life. Look at the whole verse. Their end is destruction. Those are the people whose goal is destruction. Their God is their belly. That's whose uh, people are sensual and fleshly oriented. And then he says, and they glory in their shame. What's that mean? Those who glory or boast over the things that they should be ashamed of. I'm not going to go there in great detail. But how many can identify with what I'm saying? There are things in our culture today that sh people should be absolutely ashamed of. Yes. Amen. And yet they boast about it. They promote it. They advertise it. They announce it. They use it as an opportunity for self-promotion. They should repent and be ashamed. But their glory is in the things that they should be ashamed of. Do we love them? Absolutely, we love them. Are they welcome at Family First? Absolutely welcome at Family First. They can sit on the front row every single time we preach the gospel to them. That we'll welcome them, in, we'll love them, we'll preach the gospel to them. But we'll also love them enough to tell them God cannot take them to heaven as long as they're living a lifestyle that is in deviation to the principles of the Word of God. Everybody okay? Yeah. Number, where are we at? It's the last one. Number seven. Those who have a worldly rather than a kingdom mindset. You don't need those people in your life. Look at verses 19 and 20. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, their glory of their shame. And then it says this, with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you tracking with me? He says there's two kinds of mindsets. There's a worldly mindset, and there's a kingdom mindset. There's an earthly mindset, and there's a heavenly mindset. There's a temporary, temporal mindset, and there's a spiritual eternal mindset. And what he's saying is you do not need people in your life that have a worldly mindset rather than a kingdom mindset. Now, this is the love test. It really is. We're past the frills now. This could have as much to do with religious people as it has for unsaved people. Because there's a lot of religious people that do not have a kingdom mindset. They have a church mindset. They do not have a kingdom mindset. They have an empire mindset. 
They don't have a mindset of reaching all of Hernando County for Jesus, Pastor Cesar, regardless of what church they show up on Sunday morning. But they have the mentality that we want everybody to come to our church, to our facility, to our ministry, to be under our supervision. And Paul says, you don't need kingdom, or you don't need earthly, you don't need religious minded, church minded people in your life. You need kingdom minded people. Do not love the world. First John 2 15. Do not love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in him. So I've called this the final move because we're in the two minute warning. We've been in the full court press now for most of the third and fourth quarter. But now we're in the two minute warning. Now we're at the end and this is the final move. And these thoughts along the idea of the law of association may very well determine whether you win the prize of the high calling of God for your life or not. Because you can do all the other six things I mentioned. I'm not going to go back to that screen and read all those previous six steps. But you could do all those previous six things. And if you don't make this final move to prayerfully identify and remove wrong people from your life, you'll never cross the finish line of the destiny of the prize of the high call of God for your life. The law of association. Is it easy? Let's get real. It's some of the hardest things you've ever done. Making decisions about wrong people that don't need to be in your future anymore can be some of the most painful decisions you've ever made in your life. It's not easy. It's hurtful. Breaking a long relationship is, is never easy. That, that's why most people never accomplish this because it's, it's too hurtful. It's too painful. It's too difficult. I don't know if you've ever heard this statement. This, I first heard this statement over 40 years ago. That doesn't make me old. That just makes me a very young learner. Uh, I, I heard this statement many, many years ago, and it was taught in a counseling context. I read it in a counseling book. It said this, until the pain of change, or, or, or let me put it this way. Let me, I'll just read it so I make sure I say it right. Until the pain of change becomes, well, I, I wrote it wrong, but let me explain. Until the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of change, you're most likely probably just going to stay the way you are. In other words, if it hurts now, but it doesn't really hurt that bad, nothing's going to happen because it would hurt to change. But until the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain it would take to change it, nothing will really happen. But if the pain of where you're at becomes overwhelming, regardless of how hard it will be to change, you're going to make that decision. You're going to make those wrong, right choices because you realize that without that courage to do the hard thing, you're spinning your wheels. You're, you're not moving up. You're not pursuing the prize of the high call of God. I was praying today, and I was really asking the Holy Spirit how I could best bring this home to you. Uh, you know me. I, I'm not a storyteller. I'm not a dramatist. I, I'm not going to, you know, tell you some emotional story and be all dramatic and get everybody to tear up. But if I can somehow get you to really listen how important this is to, to make right associations in your life. And the Lord gave me a little picture today. So I don't know, maybe it's silly, maybe it's goofy, but Steve might understand and Pastor Jim might understand. And there might be a few others that might understand because what I have done on several occasions is driven a school bus. 
I first drove a school bus. My first experience in driving a school bus was in 1979. Okay, I don't even know how many years ago that was. I was a senior in college, and I got a job driving a school bus my senior year. Okay, 1979. How many years ago is that? 44 years ago. Okay. Then I became a youth pastor. <clears throat> I had the best looking teenage girl in my youth group, and I married that girl. So in 1980, in Richmond, Missouri, as a part-time youth pastor, Pastor Cesar, they made $75 a week. And we had deacons that thought I was overpaid. <laughs> so I went and got a job, drove a school bus. And then uh, drove a school bus in Smithville, Missouri. <laughs> when Jared was in middle school. And I had a pager. You remember pagers? Before we had cell phones, we had pagers. Because... I was not Jared's bus driver, but occasionally, and Crystal and I had a system where if he missed his bus, she would hit my pager because I was on the highway across from our house on my last stop on the way to school. And if Jared missed his bus, she would hit my pager and I would know, oh, Jared missed the bus again. So I got to swing by and pick up Jared. Oh, yeah, it happened a few times. And then, as all of you know, I, I drove school bus here in Hernando County for a little while. Now one of my favorite songs is, I've been delivered, I've been delivered, the hold the devil had on me, he ain't got no more. I've been delivered. I don't know if you know that song, but Bob Dylan could rock it. But here was what somebody said. You could take this, Steve. It's, it's, it's silly, but it's deep. Every school bus driver has to, number one, get the right kids on the bus. How many, you, if you got one wrong kid on the bus, he can create chaos. So you got to get the right kids on the bus, and then you got to get them sitting in the right seats. Because if you got the right kids on the bus, but they're in the wrong seats, it'll be chaos. If you got the wrong kids on the wrong bus, it don't matter where they're sitting, you got chaos. But even if you got the right kids on the right bus, if they're not in the right seats, it's chaos. But if you get the right people on the right bus and you get them sitting in the right seats, it's smooth sailing. And in our lives, we have to have the right people in our lives. And I don't know how to illustrate this and, and bring it home to you, but I'm just as sincere as I can be this morning, this evening. Some of the greatest joys of my life are associations with people. But some of the biggest pains in my life and ministry have come from associations with people. Can I say something? Don't poo-poo this. Don't, don't, don't turn your nose up at this. Just listen. Sometimes the people that you pour the most into in your life will be the people that hurt you the most sometimes the people that you spend the most time with that you give the most to that you try to help the most will be the people that bring the most pain in your life have I ever regretted any seed I've ever sown into the kingdom of God never Never regretted any seed, any sermon, any relationship, any prayer, any hospital visit. Never regretted any seed I've sown into someone's life. Have I regretted the soil that it went into? Many times. But when you get the right people in your life, you're a team. And it takes teamwork to make the dream work. So I want you to stand with me tonight, and uh, we've got a few minutes. If you want 2024 to be the year of destiny for you, just start moving this way, will you? Just start moving down this way. You want this new year, 2024, 
You want the, this to be the year of the destiny of God. You want to pursue the prize of the high calling of God for your life. And you could review the notes. You could look them up on the U version and go through the seven things on Sunday. And then the seventh thing tonight is identifying and removing wrong people from your life. This could be the most practical, but one of the most important teachings you've ever heard. Because I want to see you accelerate this year. I want to see you succeed. I want to see you pursue without any weights, without any restrictions, the destiny of the hot prize of the high call of God for your life. So just begin to lift your hands across the room with me. And if there's something that I said tonight that resonated with you, just make a commitment to Jesus right there where you're praying. And say, Lord Jesus, give me the courage to do the right thing. You know what I think a lot of times is it's not a question whether we know whether or not what is right to do. But most often is do we have the courage to do what we already know is the right thing to do. I think sometimes our level of intellect is far greater than our level of conviction and if you know the right thing but you do not do it you're accountable for God but if you know the right thing and you ask God to help you God will give you the courage to do the right thing to gather the right people into your life to make the right relationships so Father God I just pray out right now over everyone in this room on this great Wednesday night. First Wednesday night of a brand new year, 2024. We've got a perfect record. We've never missed a Wednesday night service. <laughs> and I just bless everyone in this altar right now. Moms and dads and teenagers, and young adults. I just pray right now in the name of Jesus that this teaching from the Word of God will, will resonate. It'll sink down deep into their hearts. And they'll not just forget it. They'll, they'll not just look for an emotional moment tonight and, and to feel some thrill. But they'll realize that this old pastor is speaking something because he loves them and wants to speak a word that can point them in the right direction and establish destiny in their lives. Cancel demonic assignments. Prevent them from going through heartaches and pains that many of us older folks have already experienced because of wrong choices and wrong relationships that we allowed to remain when they should have been cut off years ago. But give people courage, Lord. Give them confidence to trust you. Come on, just lift up your hands to the Lord. Just say, God, give me that strength. Give me that courage. Give me that anointing to to pursue the prize of the high call of God in my life. I want it what you want for me, God. I want your best for me. I don't want my ideas, my plans, my decisions, my choices. I want your choice. I want your wisdom to be revealed in my, in my life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Pastor Meredith, just, I don't know what you're playing right now, but I'm just thinking of that song that you sang early. Here's where I lay it down. Here's where I draw the line. Here's, here's where I make the choice. Right now, I'm saying for this year, I'm going to pursue the destiny of the prize of the high call of God for my life regardless of the cost regardless of the pain regardless of the hard decisions I have to make I'm going to pursue what's best righteousness and holiness in your kingdom let's just sing it out we got to glow in a moment but just speak it out
decision, I make my consecration at the altar of God. 2024 is going to be the year of destiny for my life. It's going to be the year of the future. It's going to be the year of the favor of God. And I'm going to make hard choices. I'm going to make righteous decisions. I'm going to set my feet on the right path and pursue with great strength even in the midst of a culture gone crazy even in the midst of the insanity that we may very well see this year I'm going to walk in the kingdom with a heavenly mindset and a heavenly goal not being tossed by the winds and the waves of this world but operating on your frequency 
for your kingdom anointing in my life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, put your hands together. Let's give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I know that was a lot. There's an awful lot there. But again, if you go back, you can get the U version notes. You could put Sunday morning and then Wednesday night together, and you'll get all seven things that are necessary for you to put an all full court press against the kingdom of darkness this year and experience great, great victory in your life. God bless you tonight. Greet one another. Encourage one another. Have an awesome, awesome night. Remember, the next thing on our calendar is breakfast on Saturday morning. Uh, a live student ministry breakfast, 10 a.m. on Saturday. God bless you. Bacon for all. <laughs>